The purpose of this hearing is to receive testimony from national security experts about their perspective of the homeland security cost of the catastrophic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning, and I'd like to thank the witnesses for all being here, for taking time for your personal and professional experiences to share with us your thoughts uh, and how we can strengthen our own homeland security posture. Um, this morning, we're gonna discuss the homeland security cost of the catastrophic withdrawal, as I mentioned, which resulted in the unfortunate deaths of 13 US service members and at least 170 Afghans in an ISIS-K orchestrated terrorist attack. So it also resulted in thousand, thousands of extremist inmates, including many with ISIS and Al Qaeda ties who were released by the Taliban from Policharki prison as well as the Parwan detention facility in Afghanistan. Last Congress, I introduced a bill to make sure that there is an assessment of terrorist threats posed by those prisoners, 5,000 plus that were released from those two facilities by the Taliban. And the legislation became law in a bipartisan effort and it included, was included in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022. And unfortunately to date, we have yet to receive an assessment from the administration on the threat that those released prisoners pose to the United States, our homeland, and to our allies. You know, this hearing is actually important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, personally, because I've served in the Middle East, I have friends that have served, uh, colleagues who have served, members of this committee, this subcommittee have served, uh, and many of you as witnesses have served. Um, we understand that the threat in the formation of these ideological and, and often uh, very violent extremist groups is something that if left unchecked will continue to metastasize and get worse. Uh, less than two weeks ago, the administration released a report that I believe whitewashed and, and shamelessly shift blamed about the execution of deadly withdrawal from Afghanistan in, in a very inaccurate form. The administration continuous denial and downplaying of what happened is an insult to the service members sitting here and throughout the United States of America, to their families and to our allies. It's inaccurate to say and to suggest that the withdrawal occurred without chaos, as was suggested by a spokesman for the administration. One doesn't have to see the horrific images or footage of the evacuation for more than a couple of minutes to make a keen observation that there was a lot of chaos and desperation involved. And unfortunately, the disastrous withdrawal signaled American weakness and damaged our credibility on the world stage. There is no doubt that our foreign adversaries, including Russia and China and others were watching and that they were calculating. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, the genesis of our involvement in Afghanistan came as a result of the first and only Article 5 ever triggered through our NATO membership. And that was the attack on our homeland on September 11th, 2001. And now there are 31 members of NATO with Finland joining as of last week who look at the results of this withdrawal and it impacts not just our own homeland and not just our own security, but also that of our allies in Europe, as well as those in the Indo-Pacific, such as Korea and Japan, who had a lot of skin in the game throughout the 20 years. But further troubling is the fact that this administration has repeated the same mistakes we made 20 years ago. And now with our inability to collect intelligence on the ground, to project power, terror groups within Afghanistan have reestablished the country as a breeding ground and a safe haven for terrorism. Just recently, CENTCOM Commander General Carrillo stated that ISIS-K is rapidly developing the ability to conduct external operations in Europe and Asia and will be able to attack American and Western interests outside the country in less than six months. In addition, last month, this subcommittee held a hearing that examined how the Chinese Communist Party is working to exploit our vulnerabilities, including the CCP surveillance balloon, which collected information on sensitive military installations and critical infrastructure here in our homeland the CCP's use of intellectual property theft, economic coercion, and malign influence at American universities continues to accelerate. 
I look forward to this subcommittee's work, to coming together in a bipartisan way to look at the facts and to understand what we can do better. And while we were rightly focused on those issues, we must never lose sight of the threats posed by terrorist organizations who are emboldened to carry out and inspire attacks against not only the United States of America, but our Western target allies. I worry that the terrorist threat landscape is not just worse, but much worse since the botched withdrawal. And as I have said before, we see a direct link between the foreign terrorist threat abroad and our security here at home. For instance, let us not forget an Iraqi man, Shahab Ahmed Shahab, who was charged with aiding and abetting a plot to murder former President George W. Bush. Shahab was an ISIS sympathizer inspired by action, inspired to action by Islamic extremist propaganda. In another matter which affected my home state of Texas, a British citizen, Malik Fazel Akram, entered the United States using the visa waiver program and then held members of the congregation Beth Israel, a Jewish synagogue in North Texas, hostage for 10 hours. These are just a couple of examples of cases that highlight the very real foreign threat that terrorism poses to our homeland. Another concern that I've continually raised is the significant increase we've seen in watch-listed individuals being encountered at the border, in particular the number which are being apprehended between ports of entry, meaning that they are not presenting themselves to be processed at the port of entry, but instead attempting to evade law enforcement. This comes at a time in which we have an unprecedented crisis at the southern border as a direct result of Secretary Mayorkas' failure to enforce the laws that are currently standing on our books. It has been revealed by the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General that DHS encountered obstacles to screen, vet, and inspect all evacuees during the crisis following the withdrawal from Afghanistan. On top of that, the Pentagon's watchdog published a report which detailed its critical view, review of the administration's effort to screen, vet, and transport those evacuees to the United States. This subcommittee and the Greater Committee on Homeland Security intend to thoroughly examine these issues to ensure that those charged with protecting our security are acting responsibly and using their resources to properly engage the threats posed to the homeland. We must work together to protect our homeland. This committee, the Committee on Homeland Security, was formed in the wake of September 11th, 2001. It was formed directly as a result of the withdrawal that we will now be investigating and discussing today. We have to remain vigilant. We have to continue to view strength as a peace through strength and security as a peace through strength mentality. I was recently abroad and met with the Polish prime minister and he said this, I desire peace that is why I prepare for war. Nobody wants war, but we desire peace. We have to secure our homeland, and I think that the Prime Minister is absolutely cor correct. Again, thank you to all our witnesses. Thank you for your time and your expertise. I look forward to a good discussion to look at a fact-based analysis of what happened and how we can protect the defense and the security of the United States. With that, I will yield to the ranking member, gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Magaziner. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. As members of the Homeland Security Committee, we have a duty to protect the United States homeland and the people who live here from all threats, foreign and domestic. I speak for all the members of this subcommittee when I say that we honor the sacrifices and dedication of all who served our country in Afghanistan, including some of the witnesses who are here today. The American veterans of the Afghanistan war who I speak with have a broad range of opinions about the decision to withdraw. Some believe we should have stayed longer. Some believe that withdrawing was the right thing to do. Some believe we should have withdrawn earlier. But regardless, I want every American who served in Afghanistan to know that you made a positive difference. Thanks to you, Al Qaeda and ISIS are operating at a fraction of their prior strength. The masterminds behind 9-11 and other heinous attacks have been brought to justice. Countless other attacks have been prevented. Lives have been saved. And our nation is safer today than it was in 2001. Now that the war is over, 
it is vital that we be proactive in ensuring that terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS-K, which have been diminished due to the sacrifice of American service members, our NATO allies, and other partners, never regain the capability to launch a large-scale attack on the U.S. homeland again. The Biden administration's successful drone strike to eliminate Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, uh, following the withdrawal was a uh, positive development that showed American citizens and people around the world that we can and we must continue to take proactive steps to defend our homeland and our allies from terrorist threats. We must maintain the diplomatic intelligence and military capabilities to respond to threats emanating from Afghanistan whenever necessary. And we must also focus on the fact that many terror groups have begun using alternative methods, including the internet, to systematically radicalize individuals already living in the United States. This is a real threat that has already cost American lives and must be taken seriously. We must learn from the withdrawal and ensure that in the future, when the U.S. exits a foreign theater, we do so with adequate planning for all contingencies, including the evacuation of locals who assisted the United States in its mission. This includes ensuring that the Department of Homeland Security has the planning, the resources, and importantly, the data that it needs from other agencies to efficiently and accurately screen those who are seeking asylum. The security of the United States cannot be a partisan issue. My Democratic colleagues and I take our responsibility on this committee seriously and undertake our oversight with solemnity. The Biden administration inherited a chaotic withdrawal that was already in progress. On the day that the Biden administration began, 5,000 Taliban prisoners had been released. American forces had been reduced to 2,500. Uh, in Afghanistan, and the Taliban had retaken more than 200 of the sectors uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, going forward, we must make sure that we learn the lessons from withdrawal, that we work across agencies in an entire, uh, entirety of government approach to ensure that we maintain the capabilities necessary to meet terrorist threats wherever they emanate from, and particularly from Afghanistan, and that we have better procedures in place in the future to make sure that American personnel and our allies and those who assist us are able to leave uh, foreign theaters in uh, an uh, efficient and safe manner. Uh, so my hope for today's hearing is that we will focus on forward-looking solutions that will improve the safety of Americans at home and around the world. I've also been informed that Ms. Jackson Lee has requested to wave on to the hearing, and so I ask unanimous consent that she be allowed to do so. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, and without objection, uh, that will be possible. Um, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I'm pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States of House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I'd now like to formally introduce our witnesses. Ambassador Nathan Sales served in various senior positions at the U.S. Department of State and U.S. Department of Homeland Security. From 2017 to 2021, um, Ambassador Sales was the ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism. Concurrently, he served as the Undersecretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, as well as a special presidential envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Prior to that, he served at the Department of Homeland Security as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and the Department of Justice as Senior Counsel in the Office of Legal Policy, where he worked on counterterrorism policy. Ms. Simone Ledeen served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. She was previously the Principal Director and Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Operations and Combating Terrorism, where she was responsible for defense policy on counterterrorism activities in addition to military information support operations irregular warfare, direction, direct action, and other sensitive activities. 
Previously, Ms. Ledeen also served as the senior U.S. Treasury representative to NATO's International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Thank you for being here. Colonel Christopher Douglas is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Colonel Douglas served as a Marine infantry officer for over 31 years in an active and reserve capacity. He has led Marines for five tours in combat operations since 9-11, including leading two advisor teams in the Helmand province of Afghanistan. His last assignment was the Assistant Chief of Staff, G5, Strategy and Plans at Marine Corps Forces Central Command. We thank you for your many years of honorable service, Colonel Douglas. And Dr. Jonathan Schroden is the Director of the Center for Naval Analysis, Countering Threats and Challenges Program, as well as the Center Special Operations Program. Dr. Schroden has supported various U.S. military commands and operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Middle East, and elsewhere. We thank all of the witnesses for being here. And I now recognize Ambassador Sales for five minutes uh, to summarize uh, your written testimony uh, and your opening statement. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, and members of the subcommittee, it's a pleasure to be here. My testimony today will survey the growing terrorist threats in Afghanistan since the withdrawal 20 months ago. I'll discuss how hard it has become to collect intelligence in the country or to take action against terrorist groups that are active there and then highlight some implications for our homeland security. The threat environment in Afghanistan is bad, and it's getting worse. CENTCOM Commander Carrilla recently warned that the local ISIS affiliate could carry out, quote, an external operation against U.S. or Western interests abroad in under six months. When terrorists have safe haven, as they now do in Afghanistan, they're able to plot attacks far beyond their borders, including their ultimate goal of hitting the U.S. homeland. We learned this the hard way on 9-11. Two groups are particularly concerning, Al-Qaeda and ISIS-K. Al-Qaeda is rebuilding under the Taliban's protection. Last year, the United Nations assessed that Al-Qaeda, quote, has a safe haven under the Taliban and increased freedom of action, and that Al-Qaeda now sees Afghanistan as a, quote, friendly environment to raise money, recruit, and train. After the withdrawal, Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri resurfaced in a Kabul safe house linked to the Taliban. The administration deserves credit for eliminating him in a drone strike last summer. But that was a tactical victory amid a broader strategic defeat. The key point is that the Taliban felt emboldened to welcome Al-Qaeda's leader back to their capital, and Al-Qaeda's leader felt it was safe enough there to come. ISIS-K is probably an even graver threat. While the group is the enemy of the Taliban, Afghanistan's new rulers lack the wherewithal to degrade it. In the 20 months since the Taliban took power, ISIS-K has committed an estimated 400 attacks across the country and even into neighboring Pakistan. More than 1,800 people have been killed and countless more injured. There's also a significant risk that state-of-the-art American military equipment could wind up in terrorists' hands. According to the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, the U.S. left behind nearly $7.2 billion worth of vehicles, weapons, and other equipment. Terrorists in Afghanistan and beyond could easily get their hands on it. So could drug cartels, mercenaries like Russia's Wagner Group, and hostile foreign governments. The threats are compounded by the fact that Afghanistan no longer has professional counterterrorism forces capable of protecting its population. The Taliban certainly can't. During my time at the State Department, we invested significant resources in building elite police units to respond to attacks in real time. You may recall the diabolical ISIS-K attack on a maternity ward in Kabul in May 2020, when 24 people were gunned down, including mothers and newborn babies. It was one of our units that responded to that attack, neutralizing the terrorists and saving countless lives. After August 2021, those units ceased to exist. Just as the threats are growing more dire, the United States is now severely constrained in collecting intelligence and taking action. To dismantle a terrorist group, what's needed is a sustained campaign to eliminate its leadership, its infrastructure, its foot soldiers, and so on. It simply isn't possible to defeat terrorists using an over-the-horizon strategy. With no presence on the ground, it's much harder to plot, it's much harder to monitor terrorist groups as they train and plot. And with drones now required to fly in from distant bases hundreds of miles away, it's much harder to eliminate terrorists even when they can be found. The Zawahiri operation was a great success, but it's the exception that proves the rule. 
It remains the lone acknowledged strike in Afghanistan since the withdrawal. One drone strike in 20 months is not a viable strategy. Nor has the administration been able to make good on the president's promise to, quote, hunt down those responsible for the Kabul airport bombing, which killed 13 American service members and 170 Afghans. America's fallen warriors and the families they left behind deserve better. The harms of the withdrawal will also have profound consequences for our homeland security. The traveler vetting systems that we've built since 9-11 are only as effective as the data that's fed into them. Since we can no longer count on robust data flows from Afghanistan, these systems will be less effective at flagging potential threats. This all comes at an ominous time for our border security. We've seen a dramatic spike in the number of people on CBP's terrorist watch list apprehended after crossing the southern border, as the chairman has said. In 2022, there were 98, and so far this year, 69. We also know the terrorists have long sought to exploit our southern border to carry out attacks in the homeland. In 2011, the Iranian regime attempted to use a Mexican drug cartel to assassinate the Saudi ambassador here in Washington. A decade later, Tehran tried to use a Mexican national with ties to drug cartels to assassinate a former national security advisor. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ambassador Sales. I now recognize Ms. Ledeen for your opening statement of five minutes. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My experience with the 2021 withdrawal from Afghanistan began when I started receiving requests for assistance from people trying to help contacts on the ground. The stories of chaos that I was hearing did not align with the picture that the US government was trying to paint about the withdrawal. I was invited to join a group, a group chat that included military members and individuals with experience in the intelligence community. The chat allowed us to piece information together, forming a picture of the reality on the ground so we could help vetted people leave. It was a spontaneous volunteer effort, the scope of which we did not initially comprehend. Our strategy was to find ways for individuals who had the appropriate documentation to gain entry to the airport with the assistance of US service members who were participating in the evacuation. This was challenging with thousands of people crowding the airport perimeter. People we helped included American citizens, legal permanent residents, interpreters, intelligence assets, and some Afghan commandos. Yet as the messages rolled in, I wondered, how did we get to the point where volunteers were offering more support to evacuees than our own government? Today, I'd like to give a few examples from our group's involvement, which demonstrate that after 20 years of fighting, everything quickly collapsed. We could not identify who was running the airport. We were contacted by civilian volunteers, NGOs, universities, and corporate entities who had planes either on the ground or en route to evacuate people. However, these planes could not get in contact with anyone, nor could their passengers access the gate. Outside the airport gates, the US failed to create a safe, organized process to identify individuals who should have been permitted entry. The US government instructed American citizens to shelter in place because the Taliban controlled entry to the city and the airport, beating people, including Americans, and burning their exit documents. When the State Department said the airport was secure, we knew this was wrong. If the airport was safe, why tell American citizens to hide? For every one group that made it through, it seemed like 10 did not. Among those we helped was an Afghan woman who had worked with US intelligence on a clandestine platform with the assistance of a Marine who ran half an hour across the airport to find her, she and her family waded through a canal of human waste to get inside the airport and are safe today. On August 25th, with virtual assistance from our team, the heroic service members on the ground rescued 25 interpreters and former contract employees of a US intelligence agency, including a double amputee who came on foot with his family. Our group also supported the evacuation of high-risk Afghans who had assisted the FBI. That evening, 11 buses filled with evacuees could not enter the airport, and an urgent security alert advised US citizens to avoid the airport gates. Despite efforts to contact authorities, American citizens were left stranded outside the gates. Some gained access only after intervention from higher level officials. Many of the Afghans were denied entry, and to my knowledge, never made it out. A suicide bomber attacked Abbey Gate, killing 13 American service members and grievously wounding dozens more. Over 100 Afghans were murdered, including the young son of an interpreter who we had been helping moments earlier. As the airport gates were sealed shut, requests for our help continued for 300 orphans who were dispersed in the blast, 
music students, and religious and ethnic minorities. They did not make it inside, and I do not know what happened to any of them. Only after the Taliban had captured Kabul and Americans were taken hostage did President Biden finally address the nation. The Taliban immediately asserted its power, hunting our Afghan allies house to house. Some members of our group received torture and murder videos of their friends and former colleagues sent by the Taliban from their own victims' phones. Our Afghan allies who did not make it out now live in constant fear, many in safe houses or in third countries like Pakistan and Iran, where they are recruited by their military and intelligence services to learn what they know, learn what we had taught them. In the country where Americans have fought and died for two decades, ISIS Khorasan has regained immense strength, and the Taliban are the best armed terrorist group the world has ever known. Afghanistan is once again a terrorist safe haven. Many of us remember that what happens in Afghanistan, unfortunately, does not stay there. In fiscal year 2022, 98 people on our terrorist watch list crossed over our southern border that we know of, and 324 individuals evacuated from Afghanistan were allowed to enter the U.S. despite appearing on the Defense Department's biometrically enabled watch list. How many more have entered undetected? Our warfighters went into harm's way to keep us safe, but today our leaders act as if the war never happened. We must hold those responsible for the failed Afghanistan withdrawal accountable. In my written testimony, I've called for policies that would provide greater care to our veterans who are reeling from seeing their hard-fought their hard gains abandoned. And I've also suggested ways to improve the special immigration visa process. Moreover, I think there should be an official effort to document the critical work done by volunteer groups during the evacuation so that we can model their successes in future conflict environments. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Ledeen. Chair now recognizes Colonel Douglas for his opening statement of five minutes. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, and committee members, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. My testimony is based on my experience as a combat veteran, my perspective on our efforts in Afghanistan, and my reaction to the U.S. withdrawal and evacuation, which are sometimes confused as the same event, but were actually two separate, distinct activities. I've served our country as a Marine Infantry Officer for over 31 years in an active and reserve capacity. In 1995, I left active service, began a law enforcement career, and entered the Marine Corps Reserve. I assumed command of my first infantry company a month after 9-11, 2001. Like many Americans, I wanted to serve my country and pursue those responsible for the attack. President Bush stated, we will not waver, we will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Peace and freedom will prevail. The unprovoked attacks on America, and these words remained my reason to serve. I've had the honor and privilege of leading Marines for five tours in combat operations since 9-11. I led Marines in combat operations in Iraq in 2003 and 2005 as a rifle company commander. I returned in, to Iraq leading an advisor team from 2015 through 16 that transitioned into a task force responsible for advising and assisting Iraqi security forces during Operation Inherent Resolve and the pivotal Ramadi counterattack against ISIS. I also led two advisors teams in Helmand Province, Afghanistan from 2013 to 14, and again, and again in 2018. My last assignment was as the Assistant Chief of Staff, G5, strategy and plans at Marine Corps Forces Central Command in Tampa, Florida. While serving in this capacity, although I did not return to Afghanistan to participate in the evacuation, I facilitated evacuation planning efforts within the command and traveled to al Yadid Air Base, Qatar, to reinstate and lead the Marine Corps coordination element responsible for the processing and assisting of more than 12,000 Afghan evacuees as they fled Afghanistan. Reflecting on the current state of Afghanistan, many U.S. service members, some who've served multiple tours in Afghanistan, wonder if their efforts, service, and individual sacrifices were worth the costs. While this may better be decided by historians in the future, I can confidently say that for 20 years, the sacrifices of our service members and their families have made a difference in the lives of our fellow Americans and our counterparts. Working with our Afghan and coalition partners, we denied terrorists the ability to plan, coordinate, and execute attacks on our homeland from the ungoverned spaces in Afghanistan. We also brought hope, growth, and prosperity to many Afghan people. Terrorists remains rampantly corrupt and dramatically reverses the rights of women and girls with medieval-style rules. Stability crumbled, and the final days of our Afghan campaign were chaotic. The culminating event was the loss of 13 service members 
more than 170 Afghan evacuees and an untold number of physical and moral injuries. My participation rapidly turned from assistance with the evacuation to the assignment as the lead Marine conducting the Abbey Gate investigation. To put our exit in perspective, the Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. The Soviets worked with the government and the Mujahideen, they modified timelines, granted extensions, and maintained at least one infantry division in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan as an emergency QRF in case of rapid deterioration. Once Soviet assistance ended, Afghanistan fell in 1992. The Soviet Union withdrawal from Afghanistan contrasted sharply with the U.S. departure from Afghanistan in 2021. Many of us believed the negotiated timeline would be delayed because the Taliban failed to honor or operate within the parameters of the condition-based Doha agreement. As early as April, I and presumably many of our Afghan partners were in disbelief by the announcement of the withdrawal date. This reduced our U.S. force posture and boots on the ground to nearly zero, with immense pressure to keep the number extremely low while preparing the high likelihood of a non-combatant evacuation under some of the most trying conditions in history. I thought back to President Bush's quote, ultimately peace and freedom did not prevail. The final days of our Afghan campaign with extreme campaign came with extreme consequences. I remember why we fought there, and I'd like to thank my brothers and sisters in arms who fought there remember as well. In the words of the CENTCOM commander in a paper published in the Joint Force in 2012, we fought to protect the values that grew from the Enlightenment. We fought to give hope to those who have lived under desperate conditions and to safeguard newfound freedoms and values based on human rights that must be matured and furthered. Our fight aimed to ensure governments and their citizens are fully able to fulfill their social contracts, freely addressing social injustices and responding swiftly to curb oppressive actors. And finally, we fought knowing that the world prospers when we succeed in restoring human rights and protecting human dignity. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you again for allowing me to speak. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Colonel Douglas. The chair now recognizes Dr. Schroden for your opening statement of five minutes. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, members of the subcommittee, thank you for having me here to discuss this important topic today. I'm speaking to you as a military analyst with CNA, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, independent research and analysis organization. For the past 15 years, I have worked continuously on security sector issues pertaining to Afghanistan for a variety of U.S. government sponsors and independent publications. I've led five independent assessments of Afghanistan's security forces and numerous assessments of U.S. strategy and operations in Afghanistan. In total, these efforts saw me conduct one deployment and 13 shorter trips to the country between 2008 and 2019. There is no question that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan did not go as planned or as hoped. When Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad began negotiations with the Taliban at the direction of President Donald Trump, he stated publicly that, quote, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, unquote. In this case, everything meant four main items, the withdrawal of all U.S. forces from Afghanistan, a Taliban guarantee to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a safe haven for international terrorist attacks, a framework for negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban, and a comprehensive ceasefire. The final agreement signed by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo achieved only the first two of these goals and left the Afghan government in an even more precarious position than it was in previously. Once President Biden decided to complete the withdrawal in accordance with this agreement, the U.S. military recognized that rapid execution of it was necessary to minimize the risk to U.S. service members associated with a retrograde under threat of violence. Within two months of the withdrawal's commencement, it was 90 percent complete, a pace that was far too rapid for Afghanistan's security forces to absorb. For years prior to the withdrawal, numerous assessments showed that these forces were critically dependent on U.S. and contracted support for nearly all of their enabling functions. My own assessment of Taliban and Afghan security force capabilities, published in January 2021, concluded that after the U.S. withdrawal, quote, the Taliban would have a slight military advantage over Afghanistan's security forces, which would then likely grow in compounding fashion, unquote. That scenario is what happened. With the U.S. withdrawal nearly complete by July 5th, the first of Afghanistan's provincial capitals falling a month later, and President Ashraf Ghani abandoning Kabul to the Taliban nine days after that. In the year and a half since these events, al-Qaeda has remained a problem for the United States and Afghanistan. The group has relative safety under the Taliban government to exist and operate, though it currently has minimal capability to conduct attacks beyond the country. 
The inverse is true of the Islamic State Khorasan province, also known as ISKP. It has substantially more capability in Afghanistan than Al-Qaeda, but is viewed by the Taliban as the primary challenger to their consolidation of control over the entirety of the country. The Taliban have thus conducted numerous operations and targeted raids against ISKP since the U.S. withdrawal. For its part, the U.S. established an over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability designed to monitor and conduct limited strikes against Al-Qaeda and ISKP in Afghanistan. This capability is limited in its scope and in what it can detect, though it was clearly sufficient to identify and kill Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in Kabul. Recommendations by national security analysts to improve this capability have included establishing new intelligence networks in the country, negotiating basing access in a neighboring country or establishing a sea base off the coast of Pakistan, investing in longer duration drone platforms, increasing cyber and open source collection efforts, and sharing intelligence with the Taliban against our shared enemy, ISKP. Looking ahead, the Taliban's strong relationship with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan portends a consistent, albeit nascent, threat from that group to the U.S. for some time. Whether the Taliban will prevent Al-Qaeda from using Afghanistan as a launch pad for external attacks remains to be seen, but the discovery of al-Zawahiri in Kabul is not encouraging. The Taliban are likely to continue operations against ISKP, and these operations may be trending toward increasing effectiveness. But the resilience of ISKP, a group that was on the rebound even before the U.S. withdrawal, augurs against its elimination anytime soon. The U.S. will thus need to maintain, and possibly expand, its over-the-horizon approaches to counterterrorism in Afghanistan for years to come. Congress would therefore be wise to demand long-term strategies for doing so, and to invest in over-the-horizon counterterrorism capabilities commensurate with operational timelines of a decade or more. With that, I thank you and welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Schroden, and thank you to all our witnesses for your testimony. Um, members will now be recognized in order of seniority uh, for their five-minute um, period of questioning, and an additional round of questioning will likely be called after all members have been uh, recognized. I now recognize myself and would like to start with a brief video. This could have been handled, this actually could have been handled better in any way, no mistakes? No, I, I, I don't think it could have been handled in a way that there, we, we're going to go back in hindsight and look, but the idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing, I don't know how that happens. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. For all this talk of chaos, I just didn't see it, not from my perch. Do you have regrets of, about the withdrawal or how the withdrawal occurred from Afghanistan that cost the lives of 13 of our service members? I, I don't have any regrets. Has anyone been held accountable for what happened in Afghanistan? To my knowledge, no. This hearing is not about the decision to withdraw. This hearing is about the effects that a chaotic withdrawal has on our security uh, because it has not been investigated or looked into. Uh, I have a couple of yes or no questions. We'll try to go quickly. Um, do you believe that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was chaotic? We'll start with Ambassador Seals. Yes, it was. Ms. Ledeen? Yes, it was. Colonel Douglas? Yes, it was. Dr. Schroden? I wasn't on the ground, but certainly the videos and the accounts of what happened are in line with that. Okay. Um, Ambassador Sales, do you believe the processes in place for screening and vetting uh, by the Biden administration, in particular DHS, were sufficient to protect our homeland? No, Congressman, I don't. Okay. Um, and Ms. Ledeen, do you, uh, to the best of your knowledge, believe that anyone from the Biden administration has been held accountable or that there has been a review that the American public deserves to see uh, about the withdrawal? Mr. Chairman, there clearly has not. Um, at the strategic level, over $7 billion worth of equipment that is still good, that is still useful, uh, that our allies, in, in addition to us, helped provide in the fight against Afghanistan due to an Article 5 of NATO being um, triggered. Ambassador Sales, what is Al-Qaeda, what are other violent extremist groups able and most likely to do with that equipment um, in, in Afghanistan? Well, Mr. Chairman, the fear is that they'll turn it against us uh, and our allies and use the equipment that we provided to the Afghan government to, to wage war against the United States and our partners. Keep in mind, 
um, Al Qaeda is still using AK 47s from uh, the Soviet era. Um, we're going to be dealing with this problem for a long time to come. Ms. Ledeen, you said that what happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. How does that negatively affect our own homeland security? Uh, to, uh, to add on to uh, what Ambassador Sales rightly said, um, the Taliban reportedly are also engaged in uh, weapon sales, selling our weapons that we left behind. So that's likely one um, aspect that will come back to bite us. But uh, in addition, I think our open southern border, the fact that we uh, don't have uh, any idea who's coming through in many, uh, many areas, we can only speculate as to who is coming through and in the future um, from a counterterrorism perspective who we, we might need to be concerned about that we're not aware of. Colonel Douglas, you served for 31 plus years. In that time, uh, when you looked at the commander in chief, did you ever blame the previous commander in chief for the policies that were being executed during your service at that time? Sir, I've had the opportunity of serving under four presidents uh, since 9-11. And I can say that while there is enough, there, there are enough successes and failures through Afghanistan that every administration can, can take credit or, uh, or be held accountable for, at the same time, uh, the Taliban were not holding, uh, being held accountable to the conditions of the agreement. And so uh, that's this administration. Let me be specific. When the commander in chief makes a decision, is that their decision or, or is that the previous administration's decision? Sir, when the uh, commander in chief makes a decision, that's his decision. Okay. You can't base that on anybody else, but your uh, accountability is at the top. Dr. Schroden, from your perspective, what, what type of analysis should be done right now? And, and where should we be focused? What keeps you up at night? What threat keeps you up at night right now? Uh, well, to be honest, the, the most significant, statistically significant terrorist threat to U.S. citizens right now comes from religious and ethnically motivated violent extremists here in the United States. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night, is that particular threat. The threat from jihadists abroad uh, has increased, but it has increased since 2018 as a result of the broader decision to effectively try to end the war on terror and draw down U.S. counterterrorism assets across the globe. Uh, in order to focus more wholesomely on strategic competition with the likes of China and Russia. Thank you. My time has expired. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Magaziner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my hope, again, is that today's hearing will focus on forward-looking solutions that will improve the safety of Americans at home and around the world. Uh, the American people want bipartisan solutions and not hyperpartisanship. Uh, and uh, my hope is that going forward, uh, this hearing will retain that focus. But it's also important that the American people know the facts. And the fact is that it was Donald Trump's Taliban deal that set the chaos in motion. That Trump-Taliban deal did not include a comprehensive ceasefire, did not include any plan for providing protection for Afghan nationals who risk their lives to assist American service members, no protections for the Afghan government, no guarantee that the United States could continue to engage in intelligence gathering or other operations to root out terror threats in Afghanistan. The Trump Taliban deal allowed 5,000 Taliban soldiers to be released from prison prior to the start of the Biden administration. And to celebrate the signing of the deal, President Trump planned to invite Taliban leaders to Camp David, only canceling after the American people found out and were rightly outraged at the notion. In the months following the signing of the deal, Taliban attacks in Afghanistan increased by 70% to nearly 100 attacks per day over the same period the previous year. So look, we can point fingers all day long. I think what the American people want us to do is focus on the future and focus on how we can reduce threats to the American people and the American homeland going forward. So Dr. Schroden, I'll ask you to expand on the final points that you made in your testimony. What type of capabilities should we focus on developing and strengthening uh, in order to uh, mitigate terror attacks from abroad? 
Well, I think specific to Afghanistan, right, we, we are in a situation where the bulk of our intelligence, at least as it's openly discussed, comes from flying drones uh, from many hundreds of miles away, air bases in the Middle East, over Pakistani air base and over Afghanistan. Um, roughly 50%, if not slightly more, of their available sortie time, their flight time, uh, is dedicated to transiting to and from Afghanistan, leaving them only about 50% of their availability to gather intelligence over the country itself. So there are a couple of ways that one could try to increase the efficiency of that approach, right? One is to invest in uh, drones that have longer duration time, and there are variants being developed now that could do that. Uh, another would be to try and shorten the transit time by negotiating a, a basing agreement in a neighboring country or trying to establish perhaps a, a lily pad or some type of sea base off the coast of Pakistan. Um, so those are immediate things that I think could be done, or at least attempted to do. Uh, and then trying to reestablish our intelligence collection on the ground through human networks in Afghanistan is a harder and likely longer term prospect. Uh, but again, given the timelines I described of, of likely facing these threats for at least the next 10 years, if not longer, uh, those types of efforts, even if they have longer payoffs, are worth investing in now. And can you expand on um, your comment about uh, gathering open source and signals intelligence uh, to try to uh, mitigate terror threats from Afghanistan as well? Sure. Uh, in this day and age, um, and I think you've seen this with the war in Ukraine as well as a number of other, you know, the Chinese balloon incident, et cetera, there is a wealth of information available through open source channels, through social media, that can be harnessed in ways that was previously unavailable to us. Uh, I'm an avid Twitter user, right? I follow a lot of Twitter accounts coming out of Afghanistan. Um, there is a lot of very interesting information that could be used and combined with actual intelligence gathered by the United States to paint a much richer picture of what's happening in Afghanistan um, than we might have been able to do in the past. The, the intelligence community is, has sort of usually, tip, traditionally been reticent to rely that much on open source reporting because they don't control where it comes from. Uh, but I don't think we have the luxury anymore, especially with respect to Afghanistan, of only relying on sort of exquisite intelligence that the U.S. collects. We need to expand and include open source information as well. And do you agree uh, that uh, foreign terror organizations, including possibly in Afghanistan, uh, are uh, focusing increasingly on radicalizing U.S.-based persons in, um, in order to encourage them to uh, uh, attack uh, the United States homeland? I think that's been the case for some number of years, if not you know, seven years or longer. I mean, the, the U.S. homeland has been considerably hardened in the decades since 9-11. It is a lot harder for these organizations to get into the United States directly. And so inspiring people to conduct attacks with weapons that are readily already available in this country has been a primary motive of their attempts for some time. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Sales, Ms. Ledeen, I was glad to hear you raise the question whether an uncontrolled southern border poses a security risk to the United States. Uh, in, 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 uh, in November of last year, uh, we had uh, Director Ray and Secretary Mayorkas and also Director Christine Abizade of the National Counterterrorism Threat Center before us, and uh, this little colloquy occurred. I said, thank you, Dr. Director Abizé. Does the NCTC assess a significant threat from the historic level of uncontrolled crossing at the southern border? Here was her answer. Thank you. We don't, actually. Border security is really important. If we look at the nature of the threat and how it's evolved here in the United States homeland, it's been striking how the evolution to lone actors actually reflects how much more difficult it is for terrorists to enter the United States. We look historically at the kinds of attacks we've experienced here in the homeland. None of them have been connected to major illegal crossings or otherwise from the southwest border. And then she finished, that said, it remains a top intelligence priority. Um, does that provide you comfort, Ambassador Sales? 
Well, well Congressman, I have to say that I'm uh, considerably more worried about the state of our border security. Um, as I indicated in my written statement, we've seen a dramatic spike over recent years in the number of known or suspected terrorists who were apprehended um, coming across the southern border. Zero, from zero several years ago uh, to 95 last fiscal year to 69 so far. And those are just the ones we know about. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I find myself in agreement. I asked Secretary Mayorkas back in April of last year, how do you know that none of the 2.6 million, including the 600,000 gotaways, you don't even know who they are, and you know 41, on, it was at that time, 41 on the terror watch list have been encountered. How do you know those people aren't a source of risk of terrorism? Says, Congressman, the individuals that we have encountered on the terrorism screen data, and I said, you're not answering my question, sir. I said, you know, Ramsey Youssef claimed asylum, right? Now, I, I got that a little bit wrong. I don't think, but he, but he, he got a claim to come in. He was encountered and admitted into the country. I think it wasn't called credible fear at the time, but it was something similar. And I said, and you know that he got to go and be released into the country on an assertion of credible fear. He was released, and six months later, he bombed the World Trade Center. Among the, among the 600,000 gotaways, just that small portion, Mr. Secretary, how do you know that we're, are you waiting for a mushroom cloud? My time had expired and he was given the opportunity to respond and here's what he said. Mr. Chairman, I won't dignify that last question with a response. What about you, Ms. Ladine? Are you comforted by the Secretary of Homeland Security's uh, certitude, certitude that we face no risk among those hundreds of thousands of people entering the United States without ever contacting authorities? That, we've, that it's not, it is not a material terrorism risk? Does that make any sense to you? Uh, Mr. Congressman, as a, as a resident of a border state, I can tell you I'm extremely concerned uh, on a personal level. And from, uh, with my professional background, I am increasingly concerned given the number of, the sheer number of people who are crossing over that we, uh, again, we have no idea who they are and what their backgrounds are. Um, I, also, going back to the Afghanistan withdrawal, those first couple of planes that took off from Kabul airport were full of people who had not been vetted. And subsequent vetting showed that actually some of them were, uh, you know, had in place IEDs and appeared on our biometrics. So, uh, so I have very grave concerns uh, about this, and uh, I thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Schroden, uh I want to give you sort of the opportunity maybe for the other side. You, you said, when I was uh, uh, wrapped up with uh, Ms. Abizade, I said um, uh, that, uh, well, let's see if I've got enough time to do that. I don't. Let me just ask you the question directly. Uh, you said a minute ago that what keeps you up at night is, is religious and ethnically motivated domestic violent extremists. Given the 600,000 gotaways, that, and actually I think that number is bigger now. I have a hard time keeping the number. I know that when I talked to Secretary Mario Orcus, that was what we thought it in April last year. How do you know? that DVEs are a bigger threat than someone among the, who's lurked in among the 600,000 we've never contacted. Well, so I can't speak, sir, to that with any particular analysis that I've done on myself, or done by myself. Uh, my comment earlier was based on the uh, intelligence assessment of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, who concluded that REMVs are the greatest terrorist threat to the United States citizens right now. You know, it's interesting, and I hear that all the time from officials here, and my time's about to, but Liz's final comment. Uh, th 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 what concerns me is exactly that. That's what I get. You get this assessments. But we've seen intel fa failures all across time. It's interesting as a member of Congress, I don't know if the American people would really understand or appreciate this, I'm never told why they think that. I've never shown data to indicate the numerosity of those threats versus others or the likelihood of their uh, carrying something out. It's a very frustrating thing for me as a, as a member of Congress, I'm mean, fairly new, to see that phenomenon exist, but it's interesting to me because I, you're in the same spot I am. They say that, <laughs> but it doesn't make sense. I, Mr. Uh, Chairman, you go back. Thank you, the chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman uh, from New York, Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, Mr. Bishop, we're happy to, to share the data um, to address the domestic violent extremism with you. It is clearly the number one threat. I I'm gonna move on a little bit beyond how the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, has a significant impact on our southern border security. It seems 
uh, quite remote, and even our witnesses seem to say that we don't know who's in the six to hundred thousand, so it's pure speculation. Um, I, I would really like for us to be doing really meaningful oversight of the longest war we've ever had in Afghanistan, 20 years. Um, but the reality, of course, is that proper oversight does not start on January 21st, 2021. There's a lead up and a situation that any commander in chief inherits. Colonel Douglas, w wouldn't you acknowledge that any decision that in a commander in chief makes must factor in what the previous commander in chief did? So while that might be a factor, I think what you also have to take into account is the, uh, the advice that was provided through military officials, and that was the retention of 2,500 personnel to maintain stability and security in Afghanistan. And do you think 2,500 personnel would have maintained security in Afghanistan for an extended period of time? So based on my own experience in talking with uh, Afghans that I worked, lived, and served with, that uh, one American make it, can make a difference. And that ties to what Napoleon said of the moral is to the physical is three is to one. Really, uh, an army of lesser size can beat, can beat any enemy if they've got the belief that somebody's going to stand with them. And their belief was that one American showed that they had American support. So yes, I wholeheartedly believe, believe 2,500 would have maintained stability. I, I appreciate that anecdotal evidence of talking to a few people, but let's point out that Secretary Austin testified on September 28, 2021, quote, if you stayed in Afghanistan at a forced posture of 2,500, certainly you'd be in a fight with the Taliban and you'd have to reinforce yourself, unquote. Uh, Dr. Schroden, or uh, Colonel Douglas, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with the November 11, 2020 order to withdraw uh, all United States troops from Somalia and Afghanistan by January 15th, 2021? No, sir, I'm not. Okay, well, I'd like to introduce it into the record. It's, it's quite short, um, and I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce the November uh, 11th, 2020 memo from the Acting Secretary of Defense Subject withdrawal from Somalia and Afghanistan. So ordered. Quote, I hereby direct you to withdraw all U.S. military forces from the Federal Republic of Somalia no later than 31 December 2020 and from the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan no later than 15 January 2021. Inform all allied and partner forces of the above directives. Please confirm receipt of this order. Sincerely, Donald J. Trump. Now, Chairman Milley has previously testified before Congress that he received this order from the White House's personnel director, the PPO director, Johnny McEntee, and that it had not been vetted by anyone in the Department of Defense. Colonel Douglas, is it standard operating procedure for the PPO to issue troop withdrawal orders without any consultation of the Department of Defense? Sir, I wish I could comment on that, but that would be clearly outside of the scope of, um, of, of my position or any position that I had uh, experienced in my time in military service. Exactly. Ms. Ledeen, what about you? What do you think of uh, that process? Uh, Congressman, you want me to speak to Somalia? I'm no, we're here on Afghanistan and getting an order from PPO that wasn't vetted through DOD. Is that standard operating procedure? Uh, I was operating at a level well below uh, having okay. any ability. Ambassador to Sales? That. Congressman, that's not normal, which is why the White House retracted that order that you referred to. Right. And then they said that there'll be a drawdown of 25 to 2,500. Is that right? That's correct, which is the current number of troops we have in Iraq. All right. I guess my, my time is up. I, I would just mention to our, our majority that I, I think we all on this side recognize that meaningful oversight of the withdrawal of Afghanistan is, is very important, and we should be doing that. 
but we should be focusing not on what started January 21st, 2021 to the present, but throughout the 20 year war, and especially on what prompted the drawdown to 2,500 troops and the order to withdraw all troops from Afghanistan. That has to be part of meaningful oversight, and I hope it can be as we move forward. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair now yields to himself. Hope I said that right. <laughs> All right. Ambassador, this uh, question is for you. Are you familiar with the saying, peace through strength? It's one of my favorites, Congressman. Ambassador Sales, with all your experience in homeland security and counterterrorism, what does this saying mean to you? Well, Congressman, it means that overwhelming American military capability um, is capable of deterring our adversaries. Uh, whether we're talking about nation state adversaries such as the Chinese Communist Party or Russia, um, or on a smaller scale, terrorist groups like ISIS, um, like Al Qaeda. If the United States has the meaningful ability um, to deploy overwhelming force against our adversaries, we are far less likely to have to do so. Colonel Douglas, in your own words, what, what do you think would be the op opposite of uh, peace through strength? have to be weakness, sir, the opposite. You think it'd be fair to say chaos, maybe violence by way of weakness, something like that? Yes, sir. Ambassador Sales, are you aware that shortly after our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan that Russia invaded Ukraine? I am, Congressman. Another current event, um, Ambassador, are you aware that China flew a spy balloon over the entire U.S.? I'm aware of that, sir. Are you, uh, this is for, uh, the entire panel. Are you guys aware that our many of our economic partners and allies around the world are ditching the U.S. dollar right now, putting the dollar in danger of no longer being the global reserve currency? Well, Congressman, I wouldn't necessarily consider Lula's Brazil a partner of the United States, but the broader trend you've identified is exactly right. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Sales, I'm wondering if, uh, like any of the constituents that I talked to, um, you see any connection between the weakness and incompetence that we showed in Afghanistan and some of these other world events that I just mentioned? Or if you think that this is just a, um, you know, a spurious, non-connected chain of events. Well, Congressman, if I could take this back to Osama bin Laden, I think he said something that is instructive several decades ago. When people see a strong horse and a weak horse, they prefer the strong horse. A weak America invites aggression, a weak, uh, America invites instability. Um, and to the extent the United States um, appears weak on a world stage, um, that's not only bad for our homeland security, it's not only bad for our national security and foreign policy interests, it's bad for the stability and security of the whole world. Thank you. Colonel Douglas, you're, you are a Marine officer for 31 years, is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. I'm just a, a Navy guy, and I'm familiar that uh, in the Marine Corps, you guys often like to joke around and say you're the men's department of the Navy. Is that, is that correct, Colonel? Sir, I've never said that. You and I share some, uh, <laughs> share some, uh, some, some close associates. So. Thank you for your tact, Colonel. I appreciate that. Um, Colonel, in your opinion, who does bear the ultimate responsibility of the dead Marines, the billions of gear we left behind, um, the equipment left behind in the global chaos we see unfolding after the Afghanistan withdrawal. So I think the president said it best when he said the buck stops here. And I think that that's, that's where we need to stay is the buck stops here. Colonel in the Marine Corps, when they were teaching you guys leadership, uh, what they teach you about accountability. The one thing that, uh, one of the many things they taught us was you can delegate responsibility. You cannot delegate accountability. Colonel, do you, uh, do you feel, do you see any accountability for this withdrawal of Af Afghanistan and our dead Marines? At this point, we have not seen accountability. Colonel, what would you like to see happen going forward? Uh, acknowledgement that the, uh, the, the that there could have been better options and that uh, our way of withdrawal was in fact chaotic. Ambassador Sells, I'll ask you the same question. What would you like to see moving forward? I'd like to see accountability, Congressman, um, for a, a colossal um, 
foreign policy and national security failure of, failure of the sort that we saw um, in Afghanistan, um, I would like to see accountability for the decisions that were made. Do you think that's possible after watching the video that we watched at the beginning of this hearing? Um, well, Congressman, I, I have to say I was discouraged by the statement that the White House put out um, a week or so ago, um, which seemed to be more interested in pointing fingers than in learning lessons. I'm hopeful that congressional oversight can help uh, bring the accountability that's needed. Thank you, Ambassador. I yield my time, and I now recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Let me thank the chair and the ranking member for their courtesy, and let me first of all, uh, acknowledge and appreciate the service of each and every one of you, having not served, but having family members uh, who have served and having the good fortune of serving in the United States Congress to go on to most all military war zones, including the very first one, the Bosnia uh, war that was going on uh, with then Republican leadership going in before the Dayton Peace Treaty was signed, uh, and then tragically Afghanistan uh, during uh, the action. I was not in action, but I was one of the few members that were in, uh, and as well Iraq, and then subsequent places as well, including the DMZ uh, in uh, North and South uh, Korea. So let me uh, say to uh, Honorable Nathan Sales and Simone Ledeen, and Colonel Christopher Douglas, service that you've given, uh, Dr. Schroden, we appreciate the service in the myriad of ways that you have done so. Uh, and I will not get into the Marine Navy debate at this point, just to say they are very fine men and women who serve in both of those branches of the United States military, including all others. But what I'd like to do is to uh, take on the task very quickly of understanding the inherited chaotic withdrawal uh, that was a result of Trump's Taliban deal. And how do I know this? Because I met with, uh, unfortunately, obviously, the president of Afghan uh, did not show himself well in that moment, but I met with his leadership preceding and the first lady who came and begged, begged uh, for uh, the Afghan government to be involved to no avail. No one listened. And so let me quickly, uh, Dr. Schroden, just quickly indicate uh, that with the uh, Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense, Donald Trump came into office 2017, approximately 11,000 troops. He wanted 3,500, well, he gave permission to add troops, 3,500 were added. Uh, additional troops um, were, were NATO led. Uh, they were 14 to 15,000. By mid-2018, President Trump was reportedly frustrated with the lack of military progress against the Taliban, and he ordered formal and direct U.S. talks without the Afghan government participating for the first time. As those talks developed under special representative, who I knew as well, Khalilzad, who we met with several times, President Trump continued to express frustration with the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan and a desire to resort U.S. troops, saying in August 2019 that he wanted to do so quickly, as quickly as we can. And then, of course, the withdrawal commitment was not conditioned on Taliban reducing violence against the Afghan government, making concessions in intra-Afghan talks, or taking other actions, which we saw with a complete condemnation of women, destroying a small business, and destroying Kabul, the, the real heart of democracy there. And the United States was not able to remain indefinitely, and the American public's patient as well was getting. And so in February 2020, the United States and Taliban signed the agreement that committed to withdrawing all of its troops, contracts, non-diplomatic civilians from Afghanistan with a drawdown forces of 8,600 by mid-July and then on to April 21. Very quickly, if I might, Dr. Schroen, what are your thoughts on the Trump-Taliban deal, particularly the Trump administration negotiating directly with the Taliban, planning to invite them on U.S. soil and negotiating with them absent the Afghan government? Did that not contribute uh, to the mix of the of the controversy, and in addition, uh, as well, DHS indicated that it was such a rush, they didn't have a system to vet everyone. That's something we should look at. But if I yield to you on that question, please. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. I, I would say the, the decision to negotiate without the Afghan government in the room was made largely because that was the only way that negotiations would proceed. 
The President Obama had tried to negotiate with the Taliban previously, had insisted on a precondition being that they negotiate with the Afghan government there, and they refused. So that, that condition was the only way to get the Taliban to sit down and begin talks. That said, again, Ambassador Khalilzad's, you know, going in proposition was that nothing would be agreed until everything was agreed, and everything included a framework for structured negotiations with, uh, between the Afghan government and the Taliban as part of the end point of the agreement. And, and that, that, that point was conceded. Um, the agreement that was signed in February only established that as a follow-on step to be taken. It was not an integral part of the agreement itself. So they rolled over the Afghan government at the end. You're saying they couldn't get to the table because they couldn't get the Taliban to the table with them there. Let me just say that I was not at the table for negotiations, so I'm going to be a Democrat that's going to second guess. I don't think that was, uh, I, I stand with President Obama on that, and I don't think that we should have left the government out. We should have found a way to have the government in, maybe uh, bilateral negotiations. Uh, was there anything that you saw that resulted in, can you just be specific, that resulted in the calamity because the Afghan government was not in it, the end results, if you could? Uh, well, so I wasn't involved in the negotiations directly, so I can't speak to specific, you know, just points of discussion. Um, certainly the Afghan government was frustrated by the fact that they were not in the room. President Ghani and his national security advisor expressed that frustration quite openly to include in hearings here in Washington, D.C. on multiple occasions. Um, and so, yes, they, they were quite frustrated by the fact that they were not in the room for those talks. Do you see any homeland implications on uh, The general la lady's uh, time has expired. And I thank the gentleman. Could I just let him answer, Mr. Chairman, the last point? <laughs> Ma'am, you're a minute and 15 seconds. So if, we can, make it, if we can make it real quick, All I'll right. let you. Homeland have. Security implications of the agreement um, signed. The, the Homeland Security is really outside of my area of expertise, ma'am, in terms of the, the DHS aspect of it. All right, thank you. I yield back. I only let you go longer because you said something really nice about the Navy. But, all, right. all right. I truly believe it. Thank you. I yield back. I now recognize uh, Mr. D. Esposito from New York. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone, uh, to our panel. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your service. Uh, one of the things that we discuss regularly is uh, the view of America's credibility on a world stage. Uh, Ambassador, I, I would have to ask, um, do you believe that America's credibility on the world stage has been damaged as a result of the Biden administration's catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan? Uh, it gives me no pleasure to say it, Congressman, but I do. It gives none of us pleasure, to be honest. Uh, do you agree that our foreign adversaries like China and Russia perceive the botched U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan as a manifestation of American weakness. And please just elaborate a little further on it if you could. Um, I'm afraid they do. Um, I think um, it, it's difficult to answer these questions as a private citizen who, who, who lacks access to US government uh, collection on, on these matters. Um, but it stands to reason that if a foreign adversary sees the United States uh, run out of Afghanistan in chaos, and let's be clear, it was chaos. 13 dead service members is chaos. Um, Afghans falling to their deaths from airplanes is chaos. Um, if foreign adversaries see the United States humiliated in such a manner, they will calculate that the United States um, can be pushed back at low cost to them. Well, thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. The committee will now move to a second round of questioning. I'd now recognize the ranking member, Representative Magaziner. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me just say, uh, the reason that so many of us uh, are concerned about domestic violence, ext violent extremism, is because over the last five years, more Americans have been killed by racially and ethnically motivated mass casualty events than by events connected with foreign terrorism on U.S. soil. That's not to say that we should lose focus on the foreign terror threats as well, but the list is extensive. El Paso, Buffalo, Charleston, Orlando, the list goes on and on, and the victims of those attacks matter. I would also uh, thank 
my Republican colleagues for their concern about the strength of the U.S. dollar. I will take that as a sign that the brinksmanship over raising the debt ceiling will end in the interest of national security, although I'm not optimistic. But turning the focus back to uh, Afghanistan, uh, listen, I, I think Mr. Goldman said it well. Accountability is important, but accountability does not begin in January of 2021. There is a larger story here that if we are going to draw lessons for the future and how to do better, we have to be mindful of. Uh, so let me just <laughs> be clear about this. Uh, Dr. Schroden, when the Trump Taliban deal was signed, attacks by the Taliban against the Afghan security forces and police went up by an average of 70% a day. In the ensuing months, did President Trump or his administration ever say that, well, maybe we should slow down or rethink this deal, slow down our troop withdrawals, reconsider, push back the timeline in light of the fact that Taliban attacks were going up instead of down? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. To your knowledge, uh, so never once for gun violence. during that period of the drawdown, when the Taliban successfully recaptured 217 of Afghanistan's 407 districts, did the Trump administration ever say, ah, wait a minute, maybe we should reconsider, slow down the troop withdrawals? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. When it became clear that Afghan nationals who risked their own lives to help the United States in our mission were not being protected from Taliban retribution, was there ever any indication from the Trump administration that they were rethinking the terms of their deal? I'm not aware of them rethinking the terms of the deal, no. No. And when President Biden inherited this withdrawal and made the decision to delay the deadline for moving all U.S. troops by, I believe it was five months, uh, the former president did not say that this was a reasonable step to protect U.S. service members and our Afghan allies. He, in fact, criticized President Biden for moving back the deadline. So looking forward, what lessons can we draw here? We have talked about the importance of having a screening process in place to remove potentially special immigrant visa eligible individuals who have assisted the United States uh, from foreign theaters. One of the things that my understanding did not happen in advance was uh, the Department of Defense did not share its full list of uh, individuals uh, that could be CIV eligible with the Department of Homeland Security, which was tasked with screening these individuals. Uh, that is certainly a lesson that we should learn from going forward. Uh, we also need to make sure uh, that, as we discussed in our previous round of questioning, uh, we explore all options for uh, monitoring and eliminating terrorist threats emanating from Afghanistan for whatever means are at our disposal, uh, given the fact that the withdrawal deal did not include a provision to allow for intelligence gathering or operations in Afghanistan in order to neutralize terrorist threats. So I want to thank our witnesses for your service to our country. I want to thank you for offering proactive ideas for how we can mitigate terror threats emanating from Afghanistan and around the world on a go-forward basis. I know that all of us, despite our differences here, take that responsibility seriously. We want to protect Americans, and we want to make sure that we do it in a way that is comprehensive and effective. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, the chair, and now I'll recognize myself for a second round of questioning. You know, as I think about uh, the commander in chief, and my previous question to Colonel Douglas, if commander in chief is not liked many of the deals that were done in the previous administration. In fact, there's been a 180 degree reversal on many of those. So uh, somebody who's served for 20 plus years wearing a uniform, you don't like it, you're the commander, we'll change it. So that ability was there, you know, and, and uh, Dr. Schroden, uh, you publicly criticized the, the Biden administration's report on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Particularly, you stated the administration's report is not an objective attempt to identify or summarize lessons learned. You said it's a political document designed to deflect blame. You also said at the end of the day, the Biden, Biden is president who made the call and the disastrous withdrawal occurred on his watch. Is that true? 
Um, th yes, that's true. Okay. Um, you know, look, I, if we're going to have a discussion about the facts and, and what happened, when you're the commander in chief, you have a four year period and, and you can make those decisions. Uh, and, and what I'm worried about right now, Ambassador Sales, is in the 9 11 Commission, it, it was stated and recognized that in the days leading up to September 11, 2001, the words, the system was flashing red, was said many times. They acknowledged there was a problem. And what I want to know right now and make sure that we don't get to is, is the system flashing red right now? Because it seems like it to me with all the issues we're talking about. Well, Congressman, it's, it's hard to know what the system is flashing if you don't have intelligence collection capabilities on the ground. Um, our intelligence professionals are incredibly skilled. They're the best in the world. Um, but there's only so much they can do if they don't have human networks on the ground in Afghanistan, if they don't have ISR platforms doing orbits overhead. Um, if I could, Congressman, uh, address the broader question of the, the Doha agreement. I think it's important to remember um, that President Biden, as a candidate, promised to get out of Afghanistan months before the Doha agreement was signed. On July 30th, 2019, seven months before Doha, he told the Council on Foreign Relations, quote, I would bring American combat troops in Afghanistan home during my first term. He reiterated that message on TV with George Stephanopoulos in, in a clip that was not aired in that video. George Stephanopoulos says, so you would have withdrawn troops like this even if President Trump had not made that deal with the Taliban. President, I would have tried to figure out how to withdraw those troops, yes. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just one last comment um, about the, the terms of the Doha agreement. I'm not here to criticize the deal. I'm not here to defend the deal. But, but one thing that is important to recall about the deal is that it was conditions-based. If the Taliban did not meet their obligations under the deal, then the United States was released from its obligations under the deal. And this is exactly what Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said in March of 2020. I quote, Doha is a conditions-based agreement. If we assess that the Taliban is honoring the terms of the deal, the U.S. will reduce our presence toward a goal of zero in 2021. But, and this is the key quote, if progress stalls, then our drawdown likely will be suspended as well. President Biden did not have his hands tied by the Doha agreement. He made a decision months before the Doha agreement to withdraw, and the agreement gave him all the flexibility he needed to adjust his approach. Conditions-based. As somebody who flew combat missions over the Middle East, not in Afghanistan, but uh, has, again, two decades of military experience, the conditions-based approach is what every military commander learns. It's what every general and, and secretary of defense aims for. And I'm afraid that we got this completely opposite. It was not conditions based. Uh, General McKenzie, in fact, at this point uh, in December of 2021, stated we're probably at one or two percent of the capabilities we once had to look into Afghanistan, making it very hard to understand what is happening there. Colonel Douglas, do you agree with that statement that we virtually have no idea what's going on? Uh, I would have to agree with General McKenzie on that. I mean, you know, bottom line is even if we have an over the horizon capability, it's best to find humans with humans. Ms. Ledeen, your thoughts? You previously said that what happens in Afghanistan does not stay in Afghanistan and that lack of intelligence, how does that negatively impact our security? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as someone who uh, served two tours in Afghanistan, uh, working with the intelligence community, I can tell you that we were successful based on our human-enabled signals intelligence. We have incredible tools, but they need to, they're also limited in the sense that they need to be focused in the correct place to get what we need. And that's why we traditionally rely on sources on the ground to help direct us as to where we need to focus those efforts. Um, we have lost th that human element at this point, and our SIGINT element is dr greatly reduced so um, I would say it, there's no way to just turn that human spigot back on. We are not a trustworthy partner anymore. We abandoned our human assets, and many of them have been tortured and murdered now. So, and it's not, again, it doesn't only stay in Afghanistan. Our partners around the world have seen that, um, and they have reacted accordingly. Saudi Arabia has gone from a potential um, Abraham Accords partner to de-dollarization in two years. 
Thank you very much. My time has expired. It's time that we focus on uh, the threats and get our minds back uh, right. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we're on this agreement, I would ask you, Dr. Schroden, what do you think of the agreement? You think that negotiating directly with the Taliban without the Afghan government present was a good idea? Talk about lack of intelligence. We didn't have their input when they negotiated this deal. Do you think also that future homeland security implications can come from the, our commitment to the deal? Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. I, I would say that, again, the only way that the Taliban was going to negotiate with the United States was to not have the Afghan government in the room. So to the extent that we wanted to have a negotiation with them, that was a condition that had to be met in order for those talks in order to begin. They, they had steadfastly refused to engage with us if the, or, or to engage with the Afghan government being in the room. So that, that was a condition that had to be met to even get the talks going. Um, that said, the, uh, you know, one of the goals of the talks at the outset was to include a, a structured framework for the Afghan uh, government and the Taliban to talk and to reach agreement on sort of a future, you know, governance structure for the country. Um, and that, that term, which was a goal at the outset of the, the, the um, initiation of these discussions, was not included in the agreement that was signed in February of 2020. So you, you, what about future homeland security issues, which is what this committee is supposed to be focused on? How much of a threat does that situation now pose for us? Well, I think there's two primary groups in Afghanistan that have an expressed intent to attack the United States homeland. That would be Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State Khorasan province, or ISKP. Um, Al-Qaeda has minimal, if any, capability to do that from Afghanistan right now. And that's not just my assessment. The UN has also assessed that as recently as uh, late 2022. Um, so Al-Qaeda is, is largely a localized you know, actor at this point in time in Afghanistan. ISKP has a lot more capability to, to attack beyond Afghanistan, and indeed they've conducted some tens of attacks in Pakistan as well as cross-border attacks against both uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So they, they are a regional menace at this point. Um, they don't currently have the ability to attack the United States homeland, nor, nor to my knowledge have we detected any intent or any sort of planning or activities on their part to do that. Um, I know several people have, have quoted General Carrilla, the commander of Central Command, having said that in his estimation within six months, ISKP could attack externally. When he was pressed on that particular point, though, in his testimony, uh, he acknowledged that, you know, those attacks were much more likely to be regional or potentially into Europe, and that an attack against the U.S. homeland would be much, much more unlikely. Thank you. Well, uh, along those same lines, Mr. Sales, you quote a Washington Examiner article that warns about 98 individuals have, who are on the terrorist watch list were apprehended after crossing the southern border. So do you think this is a threat to the homeland, or would you acknowledge what percentage of the people that uh, we've encountered along the border rep are represented by this 98? Well, thank you um, for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, just to be clear, the, the source that I cited uh, for those numbers was not uh, a newspaper, but rather U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Um, I, I do think that um, the dramatic spike we've seen from zero KSTs encountered several years ago um, to 98 last year and 69 so far this year um, is troubling. Um, I think terrorists are aware of gaps in our border security, um, and they will certainly try to exploit those gaps. I would give you the number since you didn't answer my question. It's 0.0044%, 0.0044%. And these individuals were apprehended, isn't that correct? Um, that is correct, Congresswoman, but I, I think, remember, um, it was just 19 hijackers who were able to pull off the 9-11 attacks. But those so weren't apprehended, that and that's not relevant to what we're talking about now. We're talking about today, across the southern border, the percentage, and those were the ones who were apprehended. So let's don't spread misinformation claiming that this big wave is waltzing across our border to attack like 9-11. Is that what you're trying to say? We're going to have another 9-11? Is that what you're saying? Well, Congress, Congresswoman, I, I think the American people would generally agree with me that if almost 100 known... Well, we can say one person can blow up a building. Uh, so, you know, I think that's stretching the point of what we're doing here. I think we can say that our border 
agents are working pretty effectively if they have captured 98, this 98 that you're talking about is such a small percent that we are doing a pretty good job of stopping these outside people coming in to threaten our national security. Would you not concede that? Well, to, to continue um, my thought, Congresswoman, I, I think I believe, and I believe that the American people would agree, that if nearly 100 known or suspected terrorists are able to come into the United States... But they weren't. The, they were apprehended. Mr. Chairman, may, may I finish that sentence? Go ahead. Um, if uh, 98 known or suspected terrorists are able to enter the United States, that would be of concern, and it would raise this further question, how many others are getting in that we were not able to catch and that we don't know about? The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, also a veteran uh, and serving in Afghanistan, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for holding this very important uh, hearing. You know, I spent 20 years in the military, five years in Iraq and Afghanistan. I grew up in Afghanistan. I remember being 21 years old, landing in Kandahar, and it was as if I landed on the backside of the moon. Poppy fields everywhere. I remember walking around with a hand pistol, and there was, uh, there was a warlord driving a brand new Range Rover. And I'm going, how the heck did he get a Range Rover on the moon? Um, that's what we were dealing with. And then behind him was a, a Toyota pickup truck with about 20 people with AKs and RPGs. And so that's the world I grew up in. And those were our allies, right? And so the question I have for you is, is OEF vets, we will never forget what happened in Afghanistan. We'll never forget that there were 13 Americans killed just days before uh, the Biden administration pulled the rug from underneath them. We'll never forget having to, to as many of y'all did, having to put together organizations to go save Americans and also save our allies. Uh, we'll never forget those things. But I'm deeply concerned with, uh, with some of the repercussions of what happened. And in particular, uh, my question, my first question is for uh, Ambassador Sales or, or Ms. Leiden. As, uh, as was noted during the opening remarks, the Biden administration left over seven billion worth of vehicles, weapons, and other gear uh, in the country for the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. Are either of you aware of any reports or evidence showing any of these articles in the possession of U.S. adversaries are being used in, uh, in armed conflicts outside, the outside of Afghanistan I'm thinking of uh, Ukraine, I'm thinking of all these different hotbeds, uh, Iranians in particular. Any of you aware of any of anything, any of this material popping up around the world? Uh, Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of the materials, I uh, am limited as to my um, scope at this point, but I have heard secondarily uh, from other uh, former colleagues who are still in government that um, there are some materials that have crossed the border and are turning up in uh, bordering countries that are not friendly to the United States. And I would add to that, if I may, um, the many, many Afghan commandos that we trained over the years, many of whom actually came here for training, um, are, had to escape because we didn't help them. Uh, and so they have escaped to countries like Pakistan and Iran um, there have been multiple reports about them joining, some of them joining the Wagner Group and fighting uh, on behalf of Russia in Ukraine. So the, the uh, sort of global repercussions of this continue. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for uh, Colonel Douglas. Seeing firsthand the chaos of the withdrawal, what do you believe could have been done differently in the planning and evacuation efforts? And it, one thing that in particular comes to mind is Iraq. All right, so at some point, we're going to have to get out of Iraq. Uh, ideally, it's not the same situation of what happened in Afghanistan, but, but that's what's on my mind. What can we do to prevent the next type of withdrawal, whatever that is, from happening? Well, sir, to talk about Afghanistan, I mean, what, what could have happened is, is you know, we had a conditions-based agreement that wasn't being honored, was to follow the condition-based agreement. Uh, DOD was conducting planning. There was... Uh, you know, there, all plans were, were multi-option and, and multi-jurisdictional. And so uh, I think all agencies working together to come to uh, a, a, uh, a workable timeline, I think, uh, would probably be, be in the best interest. And as you, as you mentioned, Iraq, I mean, we've already seen the, the exit of there once um, and, and the repercussions of having had to go back as a service member uh, to fight the ISIS campaign, 
um, I can say that, you know, let's, let's make sure that we, we do that with uh, care, consistency, and, uh, and confidence as we move forward. Thank you. My, my last question, because I'm almost out of time, uh, Ms. Ms. Leiden, uh, has, has any federal agency contacted you about your group's effort to coordinate evacuations or any other group that you're aware of? And I'll, I'll, I'll preface with many of our offices essentially turned into many State Department offices, many FEMA offices, where we were the ones coordinating, we were the ones helping Americans. One American in particular was an, it was an Afghan interpreter that I helped get to San Antonio and, and his family or they would have been killed. I mean, this is, these are the, it wasn't a, a slap on the wrist. Is, has anyone reached out to you for lessons learned? Anyone, any uh, federal agencies? No, they have not. See, that's part of a problem. And I think part of it too is we can't let our knowledge, our information end in this hearing. We have to continue to push the issue. That's why I think it's so, uh, so important and grateful for, uh, for uh, Chairman Fluger for bringing this up. We gotta continue to, to get ahead of it because it doesn't end in Afghanistan. A Afghanistan doesn't end at those borders. And with that, I yield back, Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Again, let me thank the chairman and ranking member for your courtesies. Uh, and let me indicate that we should be finding solutions, but forgive me for trying to ensure that the record is set correct and also my opinion, um, no matter what administration it was, it certainly was not done with the Trump administration. There should have been, as they say, uh, let me put on the record uh, this whole thing of the weakness and weak need of the United States. We are the most powerful nation in the world, militarily based, bar none. Uh, and so whatever chattering is going on around the world, uh, I'm a, a, a defender and not an offender. I'm not an aggressor, I am a defender. Uh, but I know and have confidence uh, that we are prepared. So let that be on the record uh, and others can investigate it. Uh, all of this um, hyperbole and um, seemingly uh, hysteria, I think, does not fit well with what we need to do. Mr. Chairman, I respect you very much and I think we should get to solutions. So let me again try to um, set the record straight. There were some comments about uh, the dollar going under uh, I would venture to say on the record that this debt ceiling debate and debacle is more having to do with the debt, with the dollar, than anything else. Uh, and I think economists from all walks of life will say that. In addition, the people coming across the border um, are not all known terrorists. Um, they may be family members of such, and we've already seen the minute number. And I would venture to say, uh, having had the privilege, in spite of the horrific uh, catastrophic incident that generated the creation of Homeland Security Committee, I was on from the beginning. And I went to ground zero during the recovery. I will never say rescue. I walked on the grounds and firefighters were still uh, obtaining the remains of our beloved persons, Americans and others who perished. I take this very seriously and I think we do better if we find a way to work together. So, um, Dr. Uh, Schroeder, you, you, you answered, um, maybe I was not clear enough because I sort of talked very quickly, um, but let me again try to go to you on the question, and I want to ask, uh, I think it's Ambassador Sales. Ambassador Sales, I will come to you within my time to ask what are good next steps or a reflection of what we should do, and I will welcome your, your comments. In fact, let me go to you first, sir. What, what can we do or what should we do? Right now we have, uh, I used the term before, catastrophic debacle in Afghanistan. It breaks my heart. I've been there. I saw Kabul. I saw the women. I saw life. Yes, sir, your answer. And I want to go to you, Dr. Schroeder, the last. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, first of all, it, it's good to see you. You may recall that I actually represented you as your lawyer uh, a decade ago um, in a case involving an Iranian dissident group. So it's, it's good to see you again. Um, I agree with you that uh, the most important thing that, that um, we can do going forward is figure out how we can um, degrade terrorist threats that are growing in Afghanistan. I, I agree with a lot of what Dr. Schroden has said. I would not suggest uh, that the United States share intelligence information with the Taliban. Their interests are not our interests. They are not a reliable counterterrorism partner. So I would instead focus on one, um, continuing to apply uh, sanctions pressure to the Taliban until they uphold their commitments under the Doha Agreement to break with terrorists. Candidly, they are exceedingly unlikely to do so. 
Um, that means that our sanctions need to remain in place for the foreseeable future. No diplomatic recognition for the Taliban, no sanctions relief, et cetera. And the second thing I think that would be critical would be um, developing basing rights in the region for U.S. drones and perhaps other strike assets so that we are in a better position to collect intelligence information about the threats in the country um, and to take action against those threats when warranted. Thank you. It's very helpful, and that can be whatever administration is in place uh, can take uh, some instructive counseling. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schroeder, can I again get from you um, the, the, the horror of leaving out the Afghan government in that early, even though you have the details, in that early agreement and going forward now, uh, any signs of any level of democracy uh, in Afghanistan, this one, any smidgen of such that we can help contribute to? Yes, doctor. I don't see any democratic-leaning trends on behalf of the Taliban, man. I mean, they, they are largely a totalitarian, authoritarian-style government, and, and their trends have been increasingly in that direction since they've been in power. The question about leaving them out, and you, you already said it, but you, you've got to give a little bit more flesh, and you've got four seconds or, or less, I guess. I'm over. Uh, I mean, it, certainly in hindsight, not having in, them in the room for the discussions uh, was... Less, you know, less than optimal is probably a generous way of saying it. Um, though again, I come back to, had we, ins had we continued to insist on the Afghan government being in the room for the negotiations, the negotiations would have likely never taken place because the Taliban insisted on that as a condition for them occurring at all. Um, so we would, had we not agreed to that, we would largely, most likely be in a situation, again, this is a counterfactual, of, of continuing to fight in the same way that we were fighting when President Trump took office. There would be no negotiations at all. We will, I, I hear you're tapping. I, my last sentence is, but they should have been included in the <laughs> external. They, they, they should have been included in General the ladies. extending, Mr. Chairman. They should have been included in the extending part of it. I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Ambassador Sales, I want to revisit uh, since Representative Titus sort of ridiculed or trivialized what you said about the terrorism risk of an uncontrolled southern border. Um, uh, it's my time, ma'am. Um, I just was sitting here tallying, and, and I, I, I used a figure of 600,000 gotaways. That was, boy, that's an old figure. I asked staff to give me a figure. 1.3 million gotaways over the course of the Biden administration, and what B Border Patrol tells me is usually got to add in another 10% or so for gotaways that they don't even know about. They, they have some reason to believe it's about another 10% or so. But let's say 1.3 million. If 1% of that number were folks intending to do harm in the nature of terrorists, something like that, that'd be 13,000. That's 650 9-11 teams. Uh, do you have anything to add, or do you want to tell that which you weren't allowed to say during the time you were being uh, sort of uh, talked over about the risk that is entailed there? Because it seems to me, just as a matter of common sense, that it's quite grave. Well, thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I agree with you that the risk is grave, and it's not simply a matter of numbers. Um, it's a matter of specific and concrete terrorist plots that have sought to exploit our southern border. Um, as I mentioned in my written statement, um, in 2011, uh, the, Tehran, the uh, Iranian regime in Tehran uh, attempted to plot with a Mexican drug cartel uh, to carry out an assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States right here in Washington. They were going to bomb Cafe Milano in Georgetown. That's not simply a matter of statistics. That's an actual plot um, that terrorists attempted to carry out by exploiting weaknesses on our southern border. And more recently, um, in uh, 2021, uh, the, the mullahs in Tehran were back at it again, uh, attempting to work with um, an individual in Mexico who had ties to drug cartels in that country to assassinate former National Security Advisor John Bolton here in the United States. Um, we know that the Iranian regime is aware of vulnerabilities in our southern border. They have attempted to exploit those vulnerabilities to carry out terrorist attacks here in the United States. I think we have to assume that other terrorist groups, including terrorists in Afghanistan, likewise are aware of the vulnerabilities in our border. It, it is amazing to me, if you think back to that language, and it's been referred to here today, referred to here today that was in the 9-11 Commission report that the system was blinking red. That is to say that the risks were palpable. It was obvious to anyone who would analyze with common sense the risks of being hit and where the risk might come from. 
and they were ignored and trivialized by folks who, who uh, decided that they were, could never happen, hadn't happened that way before. But it's obvious that it could, and I thank you for, for giving voice to it. Uh, let me switch to something else. Colonel Douglas, you, uh, I think the phrase came from you. You mentioned the phrase, the buck stops here. And as you uh, look over, I was reviewing again uh, the, the memo released by the White House on April 6th about uh, sort of assessing Afghanistan debacle and what a, dis what a, what a disgrace it is. Uh, but that, of course, came from whom? Who's the, who said that? Remember? Yes, sir. That came from the president. The president of the United States. Do you remember which president? That was President Biden. Uh, actually, the first, first person who, who popularized that phrase and put it on his desk was Harry Truman. Oh. The buck stops here. You know, I was looking on the Internet just quickly, just thinking about that phrase, and uh, it turns out President Biden said that about Afghanistan. That may have been true. He said, the buck stops with me. And yet, all the weakness that is betrayed or that is per portrayed in the way the Afghanistan withdrawal was handled, doesn't it seem true that to pass the buck, that to have person after person, including the White House, stand up and say, well, the reason I, we could, we, this was disaster happened is because uh, Donald Trump was president before me and made some decisions, and I, I just couldn't figure out a way to get around those decisions of Donald Trump. Doesn't that actually exacerbate the weakness? Sir, the, uh, the, the initial statement that the buck stops with me taking accountability for the evacuation and, and the subsequent statement saying it was the previous administration uh, is counterintuitive to his initial statement. They're utterly contradictory of one another, which, which actually is a separate element of it that projects weakness even more. You can't even get a single line of thought going that you can stand behind. Um, it is really a great tragedy, and it proposes grave danger to the United States. My time's about expired. I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sales, you said we need to keep sanctions up, and we shouldn't have diplomatic recognition. I take it you also wouldn't agree to invite Taliban to Camp David. Let me go on, though. I don't need a response to that. Uh, I would also point out that uh, the, nearly all of the terror-related, or their names were on the terror watch, individuals who were arrested at the border came from Latin America, not from Afghanistan. And most of the groups that they represented at the time are no longer active. I would also point out that the people who are so concerned about our activity at the border, who are so critical of our people who are trying to do the best they can at the border, are in favor of cutting funding to the border. Only two Republican members of Congress serving today voted for the omnibus, which would have given more funding to the border. And cutting money for law enforcement, it seems to be part of their so-called budget plan. So if you want better border, you've got to support their efforts. And let's just be clear about that. Now, my question goes to Dr. Schroden. What if anything would have changed if the United States had stayed in Afghanistan for an eternity, which is apparently what these folks want to have happened, as opposed to doing some kind of withdrawal? Well, would that have been an improvement? Would, did you support that? What would be the situation had we stayed? Uh, Ma'am, so the analysis that I did between 2015 and 2020 routinely showed the security situation in Afghanistan deteriorating over that time frame. Um, so, you know, the, the Taliban were increasingly encroaching on, on Afghan districts right between 2017 and 2019. The number of districts that the government controlled decreased by about 40%. Uh, my own analysis in 2020, towards the end of 2020, showed that the Taliban were effectively, had effectively surrounded 15 of Afghanistan's 34 provincial capitals. So the this, this situation was not, as some described it at the time, a stable stalemate that could be maintained through the application of 2,500 U.S. troops indefinitely. It, it was a deteriorating security situation um, that would have, to arrest that situation, would likely have required the re-influx, you know, another surge, if you will, of U.S. forces to try and turn that around. So putting more of our 
men and women in danger by sending more troops to try to maintain some kind of stability. In the same way that the Trump administration and the Obama administration inherited a declining security situation in Afghanistan, the Biden administration also inherited a declining security situation in Afghanistan. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. D'Esposito. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Titus, uh, I'm not sure how you can look into your crystal ball and know how two freshman members of Congress were, to, were going to vote. Nonetheless, um, the committee I'd like to order. share a uh, quote with you. In the fall of 2020, my analysis was that an accelerated withdrawal without meeting specific and necessary conditions risks losing the substantial gains made in Afghanistan damaging U.S. worldwide credibility and could precipitate a general collapse of the Afghan national security forces and the Afghan government, resulting in a complete Taliban takeover or general civil war. That was a year ago. My assessment remained consistent throughout. That was General Mark Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, Ambassador Sells, what are your thoughts and what response to that quote? Um, well, Congressman, thanks for the question. Uh, unfortunately, that crystal ball appears to have been an accurate one um, because that appears to have been exactly what happened. Um, with, with the withdrawal of, of U.S. forces um, completed in August of 2021, um, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces no longer had the capability uh, to defend themselves and were demoralized, furthermore, um, by statements from the United States that our commitment uh, to partnering with them was over. Thank you. And um, Ms. Ledeen, in your testimony, you noted that you worked on a spontaneous volunteer effort uh, that worked around the clock to coordinate and help circumvent a broken and hostile security system. This effort highlights the ingenuity of the American industrious spirit, as well as the integrity by which the Americans operate, especially those who have served in our military. Can you explain why this group had to exist and some of the, just share with us some of the best work that it did? Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say um, the group had to exist because uh, we realized quickly that there were thousands of Americans and Afghan allies that were trapped and not able to get to the one airport that was still open. Um, they were not able to travel to the airport. They were not able to make it inside the airport. They were getting uh, beaten by the Taliban. Um, and there was nobody in general helping them. There were some specific efforts with whom we linked up. Uh, and unfortunately, we were able to help, uh, the, our group was able to help, but many, many people were left behind. Um, Congressman, would you repeat the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, just. Oh, stories. Yeah, yes. stories, some of the best work that was done. So um, I, I would say um, one of the most heartwarming stories it was about uh, a double amputee um, he had had his legs blown off. It was an Afghan ally who had served with the Marines. Um, he had had his legs blown off, had actually traveled to Texas several years prior to get uh, prosthetics, um, and uh, went back to Afghanistan with, uh, to continue to live there. And um, so he ended up having to walk on his prosthetic legs for several days with his family to get to the airport. And um, our group was able to uh, find a service members to, to come and get them and bring them inside. Um, each one of these was incredibly dangerous, incredibly heroic efforts by our military to actually go out into crowds and pull people and bring them inside, crossing um, you know, a, a canal of human waste. Um, so it was, uh, th there, there are many, many stories like this. Um, but I, I would also, um, if I may, like to add um, the, the situation and the degradation of the Afghan National Security Forces, I served in Afghanistan multiple times. I think um, I would encourage this body to look into why that was the case, where we had our military and political leaders for many years saying everything was going well, their improvements, their improvements. Meanwhile, people who were serving on the ground knew that was not the case. How is that allowed to happen for two decades? Um, I, I would really encourage this body to, to look into that, and I know a lot of veterans um, agree with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colonel Douglas, we both did several combat tours in the Middle East, fighting against more or less the same enemies. What concerns you more, sir? The increased 
terrorist encounters at our southern border or domestic terrorism? I, and increased terrorist encounters in general, sir. Uh, I mean, you know, it, I, it, yeah, terrorism in general concerns me. Yeah, um, I guess what I'm driving at, sir, is when when you, when we hear our colleagues on the other side of the aisle talk about domestic terrorism, domestic terrorism, domestic terrorism, it's kind of a different type of terrorism than you and I are probably used to dealing with. Would you uh, would you concur with that? I, I, from my my experience, I'd concur with that, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sales, same question to you. What concerns you more, sir? Um, the fallout that we're seeing from our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan and the fact that we have no southern border whatsoever and the increased encounters that you, you've been talking about over and over again and the American people are worried sick about because they know we have no southern border or this idea of domestic terrorism. Well, um, Congressman, I, I'm going to do what lawyers call fighting the hypothetical, because um, I think my answer to your question is all of the above. Um, yep. When I was at the State Department, my team and I didn't have the luxury of saying, all right, we're going to focus on this threat and this threat alone. Right. We had to address all of them, whether you're talking about ISIS, whether you're talking about Al-Qaeda or other Sunni jihadis, whether you're talking about um, uh, Shia terrorist organizations backed by Iran, uh, Colombian uh, terrorist groups like the FARC and dissidents from the FARC. Um, when it comes to domestic terrorism, uh, this is a threat as well. Um, focusing on domestic terrorism, however, cannot, we cannot allow that focus, which is important, to distract us from other terrorist threats. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, was basically taking up the same line of attack uh, as several of the other ones, blaming Trump for the disastrous withdrawal Again, Mr. Sales, would you concur and do you, do you agree um, with that assessment that this was uh, Trump's fault because of the deal that he made? Uh, no, Congressman, I, I wouldn't. And again, I, I'm not here to defend the deal. I'm not here to criticize the deal. Um, I, I'm only saying, my testimony is simply that the deal gave the president sufficient flexibility to make his own choices. And the president's choice was to withdraw. Yeah. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Magaziner, said that um, Biden inherited the withdrawal. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, no, Congressman. Um, my assessment is that the president, uh, President Biden, inherited a conditions-based agreement um, and was briefed by his senior military advisors um, that the United States should keep a residual force in country of 2,500 soldiers that would be capable of maintaining stability um, and applying counterterrorism pressure to Al Qaeda and ISIS. Colonel Douglas, do you agree that uh, President Biden inherited the withdrawal? Uh, he inherited a conditions-based agreement that the Taliban were not honoring and then and subsequently. Thank you. Dr. Schroden, what are your thoughts on that inheriting the withdrawal comment? Uh, so I would agree that the, the U.S. Taliban agreement was a conditions-based agreement and that the Taliban were not meeting the conditions of that deal. However, I would say they were, meet, they were not meeting the conditions of the deal even while President Trump was in office. And so the drawdown from 8,600 to 2,500 was also made in, you know, in sort of absence of the Taliban maintaining the conditions that they had agreed to. So in this case, I would say both parties agreed to drawdowns in absence of the Taliban meeting their conditions under the terms of the agreement. Um, my colleague over here, Ms. Uh, Titus, said she, she wants to focus on future homeland security, not reliving Afghanistan, um, and not misinformation. Is there any, is there any, uh, is there a connection between f future homeland security, Mr. Sales, and what happened in Afghanistan? Should, are the two connected at all? I, I think they are, Congressman, in a number of different ways. Um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was an enormous morale boost for our adversaries. They, they feel emboldened by our withdrawal. They feel that they um, have been vindicated for 20 years of fighting American soldiers and our allies. 
Um, I also worry secondarily uh, about the loss of intelligence information um, that we are no longer able to collect as robustly as was previously the case in Afghanistan. That is data that is fed into our border screening systems, biometric systems at the airports, uh, custom systems uh, to scan inbound uh, arriving international airline passengers. Th those systems have been incredibly effective at preventing another 9-11 scale attack on the homeland. They are more effective with more intel. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony, for your experience, for your service to this country. Um, you know, during the course of this hearing, uh, the ranking member and I have had a couple of conversations on where we go next, you know, and, and what we do with this information in order to make sure that if the system's blinking red or if there are issues that we, we can address those, uh, and we will have a follow-up hearing uh, on this. We'll discuss those issues. I'd like to thank the ranking member, um, you know, for your participation, uh, and remind the um, committee that the members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for witnesses, uh, and we would ask the witnesses to respond to these in writing. Pursuant to the committee rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Without objection, subcommittee stands adjourned.